So when someone says to you, who are you? You are all that is, has, has been and ever can be having an experience. What you call yourself, if, if, when you, if, you, if you meet someone and, and people say, well, who are you? They'll give you their name, they'll give you their job, they might give you their family background, their, their family history, where they went to school. That's what they're saying they are, who are you? But that's just what they've experienced. Who am I? All that is, has been and ever can be. Having an experience called David Icke, very brief, very interesting. The point of attention that I am is an expression of the same consciousness that the point of attention that you are is. And the same with all of us. So racism and all these isms and all these divisions, not only undesirable, they are confirmation that those that go down that road are utterly clueless about the nature of reality and the nature of who they really are. And um, I see anti-racists who are utterly, utterly obsessed with race uh, when it's just a brief experience. That's all it is. You are what is having the experience. And when, we, when that penny drops and this, as a result, opens, game over. If you look at any great master, they were monomaniacally focused on going deep around one thing. Khalil Gibran wrote one of my favorite books, The Prophet. I heard he carried it around with him for five years to get every single word right. That's a craftsperson. You know, when you look at the great athletes, I recently was in San Francisco and I watched Steph Curry play. Steph Curry was fluid like a ballerina on the court. You know, I have NBA superstars coming to my live events. And when I watch them, they are so focused on going deep around their skill versus being all things to everyone. Third mentality of mastery is the leader versus victim mentality. And if you've read The Leader Who Had No Title, you know I talk about it a lot. But you have a choice when you go to work every day. When you show up in business every day, you have a choice. You can be a victim or you can be a leader. You can't be both. And what's the hallmark of a victim? Well, you give away your power. You say, well, I'm not the boss. I don't need to bring on my A game today. Or I went through a divorce 10 years ago and I'm gonna blame my ex-spouse and give away my power and be a bitter person versus an optimistic leader. That's what victims do. They say, well, I'm resigned to average. Why should I take the time to read a book, to build a friendship, to transcend a fear? Why should I do that? That's how victims think. They use words like, I hate and I can't and that would never work. And they love to criticize because Every victim was once a dreamer who got hurt. And now they sit back in their armchairs and they criticize other people because they're too frightened to get into the game. So you can be a victim, not only in your work, but in your life, or you can be a leader. And as you know, you can lead without a title, right? I have seen janitors behave like leaders. I have seen taxi drivers bring on their A game. I've seen so-called ordinary people running so-called ordinary jobs with a sparkle in their eye. And they work with love. They work with attention to detail. They work like their work is the most important work in the world. I mean, I remember grade five, Cora Greenaway. You know, celebrate your mentors. And I was in grade five and really no one thought I would amount to very much. I was really dismissed by a lot of people. And Cora Greenaway, my grade five history teacher, saw something in me that very few people saw. She saw the early sparks of some kind of a talent. And because she cared, and because she was a leader as a school teacher, she spent time with me. She stayed late with me. She encouraged me versus dismissed me. And here it is all these years later, and deep in my heart, right at my core, I still feel not only appreciation, but love for that school teacher when I was in grade five with the glasses named Cora Greenaway.
Which brings me to the fourth mentality of mastery that I want to share with you in this session. The future versus past mentality. The, the target that shapes you, here's what's different about people. We have the same needs, but are you a certainty freak? Is that what you value most or uncertainty? This man here couldn't be a certainty freak if he climbed those, through those caves. Are you driven by significance or love? We all need all six, but whatever your lead system is tilts you in a different direction. And as you move in a direction, you have a destination or destiny. The second piece is the map. Think of that as the operating system tells you how to get there. And some people's map is, I'm gonna save lives even if I die for other people. And there are firemen, somebody else says, I'm gonna kill people to do it. They're trying to meet the same needs of significance, right? They wanna honor God or honor their family, but they have a different map. And there are seven different beliefs. I can't go through them because I'm done. The last piece is emotion. I say one of the parts of the map is like time. Some people's idea of a long time is 100 years. Somebody else says is three seconds, which is what I have. And the last one I've already mentioned that felt you. If you got a target and you got a map, and let's say, uh, I can't use Google because I love Macs and they haven't made it good for Macs yet. So if you use MapQuest, how many have made this fatal mistake of using MapQuest at some time? Use this thing and you don't get there. Well, imagine if your beliefs guarantee you can never get to where you want to go. The last thing is emotion. Now here's what I'll tell you about emotion. There are 6,000 emotions that we all have words for in the English language, which is a linguistic representation, right? It changes by language. But if your dominant emotions, if I, you know, I have more time, I have 20,000 people or 1,000, and I have them write down all the emotions that they experience in an average week, and I give them as long as they need, and on one side they write empowering emotions, the other is disempowering. Guess how many emotions people experience? Less than 12. And half of those make them feel like So they got five or six good freaking feelings, right? It's like they feel happy, happy, excited, oh, frustrated, frustrated, overwhelmed, depressed. How many of you know somebody who no matter what happens, finds a way to get pissed off? How many, or no matter what happens, no matter what happens, they find a way to be happy or excited. How many of you know somebody like this? Come on. When 911 happened, and I'll finish with this, I was in Hawaii. I was with 2,000 people from 45 countries. We were translating four languages simultaneously for a program that I was conducting for a week. The night before was called Emotional Mastery. I got up, had no plan for this, and I said, we had all this fireworks, I do crazy fun stuff. And then at the end I stopped and I had this plan I was going to say, but I never do what I'm going to say. And all of a sudden I said, when do people really start to live when they face death? And then with this whole thing about if you were going to get off this island, if nine days from now you were going to die, who would you call? What would you say? What would you do? One woman, well, that night is when 9 happened. One woman had come to the seminar and when she came there, she, her previous boyfriend had been kidnapped and murdered. Her friend, or her new boyfriend, wanted to marry her, and she said no. He said, if you leave and go to that Hawaii thing, it's over with us. She said, it's over. When I finished that night, she called him and left a message, true story, at the top of the World Trade Center where he worked, saying, honey, I love you. I just want you to know, I, I want to marry you. It was stupid of me. She was asleep, because it was 3 a.m. for us, when he called her back from the top and said, honey, I can't tell you what this means. He said, I don't know how to tell you this, but you give me the greatest gift, because I'm going to die. And she played the recording for us in the room. She was on Larry King Lit. And he said, you're probably wondering how on earth this could happen to you twice. And he said, all I can say to you is, this must be God's message to you, honey. From now on, every day, give your all, love your all. Don't let anything ever stop you. She finishes and a man stands up and he says, I'm from Pakistan, I'm a Muslim. I'd love to hold your hand and say, I'm sorry, but frankly, this is retribution. 